keep your comments down. All right. Let's open up to Exodus chapter 3. As we journey through the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, making our way through the Bible. Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Father, thank you again for all that you have done for us, Lord, what you continue to do through our fellowship, Lord, through the outreach into the community by, by the radio station, and Lord, you're just hand upon our hearts tonight as we hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the last time we were together, we saw kind of Moses coming into who he was. At 40 years old, he decided that he was going to uh, be the, the, the hand, the deliverer that the Lord would bring to the children of Israel to bring them out of Egypt. Um, he ends up killing an Egyptian, flees from Egypt to the Sinai, more specifically into Midian, which is in Saudi Arabia currently, and that's where we left him. Verse 1, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the, back, to the back of the desert, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. If you're taking note, you can write next to chapter 3, this is 40 years later, or now Moses is 80 years old. How many of you at 80 years old thought, listen, I've got a grand idea, I will start a new ministry, I'll start a new work. No, at 80 years old, you're thinking about winding down. Uh, you're not thinking about, hey, I've got a great plan. For the next 40 years, I'm going to take 2 million people around the desert and have them blame me for everything. That sounds like a great idea to me. No man would come up with that idea, right? So what's been going on for 40 years between verses 25 and verse 1? What, what, what has been going on for 40 years from the last chapter to this chapter? Well, we have God uh, working inside of a man, and he is learning how to have wilderness survival training. People pay big money for that today, don't they? Moses got it for free. He learned how to deal with flocks that are finicky. He learned where the water was. He learned about the desert. He had no idea that God was now going to use him. He still doesn't know that, right? He doesn't know that he is going to be out there another 40 years. Think about that. 80 full years in the desert. But for that 40 years that he has been working right now, God is doing a work. You see, God has to get all of Moses before out of him so that he can trust in God completely. And that's really what a wilderness experience is. Maybe you've been through a wilderness experience where you thought God was going to use you like Moses and, and it turned out that that wasn't his plan at the moment, but God needed to have you go away like Paul for 14 years into the wilderness himself having that experience so that you remove all of the old man so that you can simply trust in God. Look, now again, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock on the backside of the desert, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Mount Sinai, we'll come to learn what it is, but again, God is teaching Moses that it is only him and Moses out in the desert. Think about this. Um, when, he, when they come out of the land of Egypt, and there's, there's two million plus people. I don't know if you've been around people in any port of, portion of your life, but people complain, right? And as we'll see, they're going to complain, and then uh, fiery serpents are going to come and start biting people. 
You know, how, how am I going to deal with this? Well, Moses has to be able to trust in God and God alone. He, he, he is going to make a mistake tonight. He's going to make a mistake in arguing with God. We'll get to that. And the choice that Moses makes will play out in the wilderness because God wants him to trust only in him and nothing else, no other voice but him. And so, verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. And so he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Now, some have uh, talked about how the bush equals Israel and how uh, although Israel has burned for the last 5,000 years or so through their history in the last 2,000 years, but they're never consumed. Isn't that great? And so here is this burning bush. I don't know about you, but if you're in the wilderness for 40 years, something like that is going to get your attention, yes? And so, (laughs) verse 3, Moses said, listen, I've got nothing else to do today. I mean, think about that. You're in the desert for 40 years with sheep. Anything else than sheep or goats is exciting. Anything other than a rock. If it was a new rock, hey, that I haven't seen that rock today. That would be exciting. So he says, um, I will turn now aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. Do you know it with me in verse 3? You know you've been in the wilderness a long time when? When you start talking to yourself. Did you see that? He's talking to himself. Is he going to answer himself? Stop it. (laughs) Verse 4, and so when the Lord saw that he turned. I want you to note that. When the Lord saw that he turned. So if Moses would have looked at the bush and said, I've seen a thousand burning bushes and kept going on his way, we would have not had the next verse. Do you get that? So it is always what God does, and then our response, and then back to that. So our response is that we uh, turn aside to that, and God's response is, and so the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, and God called to him from the midst of the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses, And he said, here am I. Now, I do a poor Charlton Heston version. By the way, do you know that in the movie, that the Lord's voice is Charlton Heston's voice? Anyone know that? That's free, by the way. That's trivial. You'll win that one. All they did is just change his his voice a little bit, and they brought down the pitch. And so that's Moses' voice, Charlton Heston's voice. I, I, I always loved that. And so he says, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And then he said, Do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. So from this point on, Moses is going to start to learn how to deal with a holy God. And more specifically, for our purposes, through the Old Testament, we're going to see that God is going to place a barrier between God and man. Now, in the New Testament, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen? But in the Old Testament, God is setting a foundation of, listen, I am a holy God, and he is still the same holy God in the New Testament, but here is a holy God, and not anyone can just approach me. And you must approach me in the right way. So when we get to the New Testament, as we'll see tonight, Jesus says, I am then the door, and now you can come into the presence of my Father. Do you see that? So everything that you see here is God. Um, setting this foundation for the rest of mankind and specifically for the Old Testament and the Jews to understand you just can't come to God with your Adidas on. You got to take them off. So, moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face and he was afraid to look upon God. It's important what God does here is he sets... Again, to Moses, hey Moses, I am the same God that I made this promise to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 15. I'm that God. I'm the same God that produced this line of Israelites coming from Jacob, this, these 12 tribes. This is all in my hand, uh, and this is all of what I've done. Note with me in verse 6 what Moses does when he hears that, and then he sees 
what he sees. He hides his face. We're starting to see that man must humble himself in the sight of the Lord. And so Moses is learning that. Verse 7, And so the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people. Would you note with me that for 400 years the children of Israel have been in Egypt? Again, from last week, we're not really sure when the oppression started, but at some point the oppression started, and at some point the cries of the Israelites went up to the Lord, and he says, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. Now, The question is, why hasn't God done anything yet to help them and take them out of the land of Egypt? Well, a couple of things. Number one, Moses isn't ready. Don't you hate that when your deliverer isn't ready? (laughs) And number two, the iniquity of the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, as we'll read, hasn't been complete yet. You see, God is still working and giving that group of people in Canaan the opportunity to repent of their sin. So oftentimes when we look at a situation and we, Lord, right now, why isn't it going on? Well, because I have, (laughs) there are other uh, factors in the wind right now uh, and they need to come, well, they need to have some wilderness training. And so he said, I have seen the oppression of the Egyptians and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters and notice, I know their sorrows. Can I help you tonight, wherever you are, um, that God knows where you are, and he knows your sorrow. And again, you may not be excited about the timeline that God's working on, but he knows what's going on with you. Remember, he is a loving father, and he knows what's going on with his children. And so I have come down, notice, to deliver to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up, uh, bring up from that land to a good and large land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression of the Egyptians and how they oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you might bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, at that point, we would have expected the next verse from Moses to say, yeah, I've been waiting for 40 years. Let's go. Get the camel, honey. We're going to Egypt. But that's not what happens. I find this interesting. I hope you do. Moses has changed in 40 years. How many of you have changed in 40 years? Right? You go through different portions of your life, and Moses has changed. Moses was this guy at 40 years old who was excited. He got a sword on his hip. He's ready to take down Egypt. And all of a sudden, being alone with goats in the wilderness changes your life. And now what he says in verse 11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? I like that. He says, who am I? Now, he is obviously not excited about this, right? Who am I? Well, Moses, you're the same guy that I called 40 years ago, but it has taken these 40 years to get you to the place where I can use you now. I don't know about you, but I don't want to work on God's 40-year plan or 14-year plan like Paul, the apostle. And so he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be your sign and that you have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. So in verse 12, this is the basis of all that Moses needs. What does he need? All he needs is who? Let's read it together. Maybe you didn't underline it. I will be with you. You can write above it. You're not going to be alone. You see, when you get saved, when you accept Jesus Christ in your life, it isn't like he says, well, great, see you in heaven. He is not going to leave you or forsake you. As soon as you accepted Christ as your Savior, 
you are not alone. Before you were alone, and now you're not. Isn't that good news? He says, you're not alone. Now, at that point, um, should all the verses be different? So, sorry, Lord, you're right. Get the camels, honey. We're going to Egypt. Then Moses said, <laughs> Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers have sent me to you, and they say, say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Now, in my mind, I, I, whether it's overt or not, I still think he's starting his, his line of excuses. Have you seen it? it this one's subtle. The other ones are going to be blatant. All right, going to be right in our face. But I think it's like, okay, yeah, but if I go to you, I mean, they're going to say, you know, who is this God anyway? He's making his excuse. It starts out small, and it will end with a giant one. And notice in verse 14 what God says. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And so this becomes the Old Testament name for the Lord, and I might add, as we'll see in a minute, the New Testament name of the Lord. It is I am. I am, or I am the becoming one. I will become whatever you need God to be at that moment. I will be a banner to you. I will be a help to you. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus makes seven I am statements. And, and really, you need to know these. These need to be somewhere in your Bible. In fact, I've got, I, I printed them out, and we'll make copies for, for you if you, if you um, can't uh, write them out for yourself. But these are the seven I am statements. And so this kind of encapsulates who God is in totality for us. And again, these are all from John. John 6.35 starts it out. And look, if you're spiritually hungry then you need to know that Jesus is the bread of life. For he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So what is Jesus saying to those who are hungry? Perhaps you were hungry before you came to the Lord, and you were searching and you were seeking out to fill yourself with all kinds of whatever the world. Listen, the world has an amazing buffet, does it not? And it will fill you up. I, I, I tell you guys this all the time. I mean, listen, Krispy Kreme makes an amazing donut. When that hot light's on, it's like a temptation from the devil. Now, if we had Krispy Kreme donuts every day, uh, I mean, our taste right here would love it. And this would love it. But this whole area here <laughs> would not love it. And so that's what the world does. The world offers us Krispy Kremes. It looks good for the moment. Oh, it tastes good for the moment. It stimulates the brain for a moment, but then it wrecks the body. That's what sin does. Sin's a Krispy Kreme. Now I'm going to get a letter from them. Um, I've just defamed the Krispy Kreme Corporation. If they would sponsor our radio station, then it would be different, Tim. Then we would give them a glowing... So what happens. And so what happens then when we're spiritually hungry before we come to Christ, right? Jesus says, hey, come to me and I will give you what you need. Now, I don't want to have a testimony party, but guys, would you not agree with me when you come to Christ? It may not happen right away, but eventually you are satisfied with Christ and all that he has for you, and different walks of life, and where you are, and your, your struggles, and in your storms, you realize, I can take a bite of the bread of life, and that's all I need. And, you know, it really hits home when Paul says to be content in all things, because I'm content with the bread, and then I'm thirsty no more. Well, that's number one. Number two is from John chapter 8, verse 12. For those who are spiritually blind, groping around in the dark, looking for meaning, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. 
I know no better definition of our life before Christ than that walking and groping around in the darkness, stumbling around from place to place. Jesus becomes the light of the world. Number three, from John chapter 10, verse 9. Again, for those who were wandering, who were lost, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. You know, the thing about a good shepherd, and Jesus makes this point, doesn't he, in the Gospels? He makes the point between a hireling and the good shepherd. And the hireling, when he sees danger coming, the hireling runs away and puts himself behind the sheep. And the good shepherd runs towards danger and protects the sheep. Number five, from John chapter 11. For those who are fearing death, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me, notice with me, shall never die. And he makes this great question, do you believe this? For those fearing death. You know, guys, the world fears death, does it not? It's amazing to me how many people without Christ, obviously, fear death. It, it is their number one concern. They are concerned about death, what is going to happen to them. And yet Jesus makes this simple declaration to us, and he says, I am life. And he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Guys, today, some of you may not know, but... Um, we had some members at our church years ago, and um, she went home to be with the Lord last night. And right now, she's living. She's not dead. See, no one ever dies. They just move. And they get a great new body that has no pain. It has no cancer. It has no sorrow. And it touches the Savior. Isn't that great? Oh, to be where Kelly is right now. You know, when, often when death comes in our life and, and around us, you, you understand when Paul says, man, I want to go home to be with the Lord, but I also know I got work to do on planet Earth. There is this tug in his own life. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says to those who are unsure of the truth, who are searching for truth, he says, I am the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. There is only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus. And lastly, from John chapter 15, verse 1 and 5, for those looking to the meaning of life or the fruitfulness of life. He says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. And then he says it again, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me, how much can we do, guys? <laughs> you can do nothing. I love kind of verses in the Bible that give great clarity. How much is nothing? A nothing. So you can do nothing apart from Christ. Now back to Exodus, which hopefully you're still there. And now he says in verse 16, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And I have said that I will bring you up out of the affliction of the out of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites to a land flowing with milk and honey. And then you will heed, the, heed your voice, and you shall come, you and your elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to them, the Lord God of the Hebrews excuse me, has met with, met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we might sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, 
No, not even by a mighty hand. And we'll get into that in a minute, why God is talking about this three-day um, journey. And so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders which I will, uh, uh, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will not... Uh, I'm sorry, and after that he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty-handed, but every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and your daughters, and you shall plunder the Egyptians. So for the amount of time that they have spent in the wilderness, or in the wilderness, in Egypt, they have not got paid, right? So what is Jesus, uh, what, is, what is the Father saying? He's saying, you're going to get your back wages. God always provides, God always takes care of. Chapter 4. Then Moses answered and said, but, now hold on, that was a great plan. Did we not hear a great plan for the Lord? It sounded really good. And he said, I'm going to be with you. So what's your problem, Moses? What is our problem when we hear from God? God's going to be with us. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. Again, how many of you in this room have starved lately? We have it so well in the United States of America. And then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they will say the Lord has not appeared to you. So now the... Um, escalation of excuses starts to build. So we started out with a small one, and now we're going higher. And so the Lord said to him, What is in your hand? And he said, A rod. Don't you find this interesting? I do. When God calls anyone into ministry or to do anything for him, he often says, what is in your hand? And the idea is, what is your gifting at that moment? Now, Moses obviously has a rod in his hand, does he not? He is a shepherd, and he is going to use that rod to shepherd. What was in the hand of a man named Matthew in, obviously, his book of Matthew? He was an apostle. He had in his hand a pen. You see, he was a tax collector, and a tax collector used a pen because the Romans were very good at keeping records. And so God says, oh, I'm going to call you, Matthew. You have a pen, and I'm going to have you pen the gospel. What did the little boy have in, in his hand? when there was 5,000 men, just men, and maybe another 10,000 women and children. Well, he had two loaves uh, and, some, uh, and some fish, did he not? Five loaves and two fishes. And then we saw the um, disciples tackle him and take it away from him. Hey, there's a kid over there. He's got a bad lunch. Get him! God will use that. Now, you know what I love about that story? You know, that's from John chapter 2. I love that that the hero of that chapter is who? It's the mom. It's the mom who said, don't forget to take your lunch. Oh, mom, no one's going to, just take your lunch. It was the mom as the hero of that chapter, without the mom. And so God used what was in that boy's hand. What is in your hand? Are you a plumber? Are you an electrician? Are you a car mechanic? Are you an air traffic controller? We do have one in the room. What do you have in your hand? I don't know. But what you need to say is, Lord, whatever I have, I want you to use it for your kingdom. Whatever it is. I don't know what it is. But God will use whatever is in your hand. Well, verse 3. (laughs) And the Lord said to him, cast it on the ground. And so he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. Now, again, we're learning, Moses, Moses, you're learning to do exactly what God tells you to do. This is going to be important in Egypt. So he takes his rod, he throws it on the ground, and it becomes a snake. Now, this isn't some rubber snake. How do we know that? Because he runs away from it. He knows what a snake is, yes? It's a real snake. 
By the way, pause. God can use what's in your hand for good, or you can throw it down and use it for evil. I mean, think about how many musicians are out there that God gave them the ability to pluck that guitar. I think about a guy like Eric Clapton. Amazing guitar player, right? God gave him the ability to just do amazing things on that. He should be a worship leader. You see, you can use things for evil as well as good. Well, verse 4, it gets better. (laughs) Then... (laughs) Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. Would you note with me that, and this is good information for the kids, because they're reading the Bible, and you parents need to inform your kids. Listen, just because it's in the Bible, remember, God is just telling Moses to do this. He's not telling you if you see a snake to pick it up by its what? What's the worst place to pick up a snake by? Thou shalt not pick up a snake by a tail. Because you will get what? You will get bit. That is gospel truth. But this is just God dealing with Moses. And here again is the idea. He is teaching Moses to listen and to trust God even when it doesn't make sense. Right? Lord, um, why do you want me to pick it up by the tail? That doesn't make sense. I'm a shepherd. I know snakes. I've seen them in the wilderness for 40 years. You just don't do that. Moses, pick up that snake by its tail. Does make sense. I know. Picks it up, becomes the rod again. How many times has God made a statement to you and you go, that seems stupid? Yeah, it does. From a human perspective, it makes no sense. And God says, that's why I'm God and you're not. And so, verse 5, and they made that, I'm sorry, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, now put your hand into your bosom. And the idea is into his cloak. And he put his hand into, Uh, in his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. Now, that would have freaked anyone out, right, let alone Moses. Because leprosy, much like it is today, is still uh, without a cure, and it's a death sentence. And so, verse 8, no, 7, and he said, put your hand in your bosom again, I mean, put it back in your coat, and so he put it, put his hand back in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom and behold, it was restored like the other flesh. Again, God is teaching Moses, I'm going to do signs and wonders through you. Is he not? He's going to touch the Nile. He's going to call frogs and lice. And what Moses needs to know is that God is in control of the supernatural. Not about you, but I got that on snake one. I didn't need any other lessons. Did you? But God knows who he's dealing with. He knows he's dealing with a stubborn man, Moses. Moses needs more than one sign. God knows that. And so, (laughs) I would have been good with a snake, but whatever. And then it will be, if they do not believe you nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe you on the two signs, Or listen to your voice that you shall take water from the river and pour it onto dry land, and the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. And again, this is all to confirm who God has chosen, and that is Moses. Verse 10. And then Moses said to the Lord. Now, again. I'm, I'm not here to beat up on Moses, and I've, in fact, I think we probably would have said the same thing. A lot of us would have done that. But Moses has a lack of confidence, and now his excuses are going to grow. And he says, oh, my Lord, um, I am not eloquent, neither before since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow to speech and slow of tongue. Again, 
Lord, you can't use a guy like me because I am slow of speech. I'm not a good speaker. That is, that's what he's saying. But remember, how did we start this whole ball of wax? We started with the Lord will be with you, Moses. It doesn't matter if you're slow of speech or you're not a good speaker. Look at me. I'm a product of the Napa Unified School District. Uh, I know very well that I make up words in this, this pulpit um, a lot. I know a lot of you enjoy that. Um, that's why you come. I can't wait to hear what he's going to do this week. I could say that very same thing. You know what? I'm not a good public speaker, Lord. You can't use me. You know, he, he is not looking for excuses. What God is looking for is availability. And as long as you're available, and guys, this is all I had going for myself way back when, uh, when I was just helping out behind the soundboard at Cornerstone Ministries in Napa Valley. That's all I was doing. And I just said, you know what? They need help in the high school ministry and I'm available, I got nothing going on, I might as well help out in that, and that's where God will use you, and from that point on, he will build, and he will give you the gifts, and he will equip you for what you need. Don't ever say that I'm not a good speaker, or I'm not a this, or I can't do that. God will equip you for whatever he's called you to do. That's the great thing about being in the body of Christ. So let's continue his um, excuses. And so the Lord said to him, now, you you don't really, uh, this is sometimes the problem with the voice inflection. We don't hear that, right? But I hear the Lord kind of getting a little, the Lord will get mad in a minute. But I can hear him saying, what are you talking about? Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, and the seen, or the blind? Have I not? The Lord, he says, I am God. I know that you may not be a good speaker. That's beside the point. And better that you are not because then people won't say, well, he's a good speaker. They'll say, man, if if God can use that guy, he can certainly. Is that not why we love Peter? In fact, on Sunday morning, we're going to talk about Peter and Apollos and Paul and those different ministries and what they look like. And we appreciate a guy like Paul, or like Peter, who, man, he doesn't, very, he doesn't speak very well. He's a country bumpkin, and yet he did amazing things through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, therefore, go. Don't you love that? Let, no, I don't want to hear it, Mo. Stop. Go, and I will be with you, and I will be with your What? I will be with your mouth, and I will teach you what you shall say. It should have ended right there, right? (laughs) Moses, I know you're slow. I, uh, I know you're not a good public speaker. It doesn't matter. I will work through you. You will be my mouthpiece. Everything will be fine. And here is when the wheels fall off of the cart. Verse 13. And he says, oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you will send. And right there we learn that he is just plain, plumb, unwilling to go. Sometimes the dangerous thing of being so long in the wilderness, you get comfortable with the wilderness. For 40 years, he's been comfortable with them sheep and them rocks and the scorpions and the snakes. And it's comfort to him. So oftentimes we can get comfortable in our wilderness experience. But you need to know this. You're not allowed to stay in that wilderness experience your entire life. I don't know what the time period is for you. But that's not your permanent residence. Your permanent residence is in the good land that's flowing with milk and honey. Well, um, This is where, um, well, verse 14, let's see. And so God gets mad. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Listen, you don't want to have your name in there ever. And the the Lord's anger, anger was kindled against, and put your name in there. By the way, have you seen how many excuses he has made? 
And then how many times God has equipped him? Listen, I'm going to do that for you. Don't worry about that. Well, what about this? Well, I'm going to do that for you. Well, what about this? Well, and finally, God's like, oi, vey. I, should, I, should, I really should get another guy. But God has invested how many years into this guy? Forty years. I want you to think about that for a minute. In the wilderness, for 40 years, God may not have said one word to him, and yet God is training him. You know, I, I love the fact that it, it is very possible that Abraham had not heard from the Lord for 25 years, and the question is always, can you continue in your walk with God and not hear from him again for 25 years and still be fine with your walk with God? Remember, what was the last thing that God told you to do? And so now he, God is really, really <laughs> uh, mad. And so he says this, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well, and look, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in heart. Now note with me, he says, Is not Aaron um, the Levite your brother? And then he says, I know that he can speak well. When God brought Aaron, it wasn't God, exp uh, well, it was God expressing his chastening of Moses, not approval. Why? Because Aaron will become a problem to Moses and not a benefit. Remember the whole golden calf thing? Whose idea was that? Uh, Brother Aaron. What about the rebellion? Um, Aaron started it. So, Think about this for a minute. If you complain long enough, God will give you what you want, but that want may not be the exact thing that you need. How about that for scary? Listen, Aaron was a smooth talker, but he was a weak man of content. Say that again. Aaron was a smooth talker, God tells him that, but we know he was a weak man of content. Why is that important? Because, the ch because today the church needs content over smooth talking. Let me say that again. Today the church doesn't need a polished, and we'll get to this Sunday, we're going to talk about hero worship and celebrity pastors. That's not what the church needs. It doesn't need a smooth-talking man. It needs the man that has the content inside of him. The church doesn't need any more smooth talkers. They're all around us, and they're all programmed from what the world would say and how to sell. That's not what the church needs. The church needs content. Thank you. <laughs> now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman. Did you see that in verse 16? So Aaron will be like a modern newscaster. See, a modern newscaster, he only reads what the teleprompter tells him to read. You see, somebody else has wrote all of that down come up with this great show. It's not the anchor doing it. He's just reading a teleprompter. Now, the local markers might be different, but I'm talking about the big kahuna shows, right? Aaron, in effect, becomes nothing more than a mouthpiece for Aaron, or uh, and for, for Moses. And so he will be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be a, a, the mouth for you, and you shall be to him as a god. And you shall take this rod in your hand, and, and which you shall do signs. Guys, what was the perfect plan of God and the will for Moses? That he would be the, ultimately the mouthpiece, right? That it would go directly from God to Moses. Now it goes from God to Moses to Aaron. Um, if we start a conversation over here, by the time it gets over here, it may be different, right? And God wants the uh, least amount of people involved with that. Moses should get it directly from the Lord and then give it out to the people. 
Verse 18. So Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Did you see that in verse 18? There's some good character by Moses. Listen, I know I'm, we're kind of beating on Moses a little bit, but he has a lot of great qualities. He is an amazing man. As we will journey with him for the next four books of the Bible, he is an amazing man. Did you pick up with him? You, you look at it over. I have some water. What did he do? He was a good employee. He went to, to his dad, his father-in-law, and said, Hey, father-in-law, I am not going to leave without telling you what I need to go do. And so he kind of gave him his, maybe an hour notice or something, but he at least gave him notice, and he allowed Jethro to say, verse 18, go in peace. And so the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go return to Egypt for all the men who are dead, who are dead, who sought your life. And so Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those things. Let me do that again. See that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let my people go. Now, we're not going to get bogged down on that. We'll talk about God hardening his heart and then Pharaoh hardening his heart and what that looks like a little bit later. And then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And so uh, I say to you, let my son go that he might serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Verse 24, so it came to pass on the way of the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. <laughs> what? what? What was that? Okay, you've set on this trek, God's told you everything, you're my messenger, and now they've stopped and God has to come down. All right, Moses, I have to kill you now. What? You see, there's something missing in Moses' life. Let's see what it is. Verse 25. So Zipporah, that's his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. And so he let him go. And then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. Now, this is a little odd. I would, I would agree with you. However, Moses has not circumcised his sons. Is, was that a requirement? Who did we learn that from? We learned that from Father Abraham, who had many sons, and many sons at Father Abraham. Let's all sing. So we learned that. In order to be a Jew, to be a part of this covenant, there must be a circumcision. But the New Testament tells us that judgment starts where? In the house, right? In our house. In the house of the Lord. Moses is going to be the judgment of the Lord upon the land of Egypt, and he hasn't even started out in his own house to get it right. You see that? And the wife freaks out. Now, she possibly, I mean, it's very likely that um, they don't have the circumcision custom in their tribe, in their area. And so this is really to her. I mean, she says that. This is a bloody thing. You're making me. Frightening, though, um, would you note with me, men, that the wife is doing what Moses should have done. And I can understand the frustration of the wife when she has to play the role of the husband. So that is why, husbands, it's important for us to take on those responsibilities that God has called us to do. And so, verse 27, And so the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness and meet Moses. And so he went, and he met him on the mountain of God and kissed him. And so Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord which he had sent to him. 
and all the signs which he had commanded. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. And then he did the signs in the sight of the people. And so notice this in verse 31. This is um, very important because of the next few chapters that we're going to get into. And so the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he looked on their affliction, they bowed their heads and they worshiped. Um, let, let me give you the um, kind of the interpretation of that verse. It would mean, and then they believed what God was about to do. Everybody got that? Why is that important? Because in the next chapter, they freak out. Now, wait a minute. If they, verse 31, believed and then worshiped God, what they're telling God is, listen, Lord, we got it. We're on board with your plan. But the problem is we don't like God's plan oftentimes. And that's what will happen next week. Oh, next week, chapter 5 and 6. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word and for the example of your servant Moses. And Lord, thank you for what you're doing. And Lord, as we see the great I am statements in the New Testament, that Lord, you become whatever we need when we are seeking and looking for answers. Thank you, Lord, that you are the resurrection and the life. And Father, that we won't taste death, that we'll just move to a new body. Thank you, Lord, that we will hunger no more for the things of this world, but, Lord, that you would satisfy us. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing here. And, Lord, we're excited to see the next steps of, as we walk in this journey of faith. We thank you, Lord, for your word and how powerful it is in our life. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We'll worship this last song together. Again, men, you have a breakfast at 8 a.m. on Sunday.